Buckle up, everyone. You are strapped in and ready for the Insurance Hour with me, your host, Carl Sussman, informing, educating, and entertaining Californians one policy at a time. This is Insurance Hour. Hello, hello. How are you today? This is Insurance Hour. I am your host, Carl Sussman. Thank you so much for being here today. What a day. Well, let's get through all the housekeeping. The phone lines are open for your questions. Give us a call, 559-656-0317. You can call or text that number. Calling is better right now if you want to get on the air. Or you can send us a question to questions at insurancehour.com. If you want to join our text group and you want to be able to be updated with important insurance-related news as it happens, shoot us a text to 5674-CARL. That's 567-F-O-R-K-A-R-L. Or for those of you with a phone without letters, it's 567-367-5275. Whew. Try that 10 times fast. We have a ton to talk about today, and so I want to jump right in. We are taking your calls. We are taking your questions, so I may get interrupted, and we'll just jump right out and into the question as it comes. But I wanted to take some time today to talk about some things that are happening around in the insurance industry countrywide. And when I say countrywide, I mean things that are affecting people in every state of the country. Now, of course, all eyes are on Florida because of the terrible hurricane that's occurring there. And by the same token, we're looking at wildfires that are literally burning as we speak in the state of California. So literally from from sea to shining sea, we have catastrophe events that are happening and unfolding before our eyes. So what is this going to mean in the short term? and the long-term for the insurance industry. That's what I want to talk a little bit about first. Now, again, we hear about these events happening, and we assume that there's going to be some impact on the industry, but I don't think we're always clear on specifically what that is going to mean. Now, let's keep in mind with an insurance company, this is a private company that is going to take premium, and they're going to decide what the risk level is, what's the likelihood of a loss happening. And based on that likelihood, they're going to come up with a premium that they think they need to collect to be able to make a profit, meaning there's less likelihood of you having a claim than more likely, right? And if there's more likelihood, they're going to charge a higher premium. That's the oversimplified version. Now, fast forward and jump to where we are today. We have these events that are happening that are causing billions and billions of dollars in damage. And they are happening with some level of consistency. So how do you turn around and price something where there's a near certainty that there's going to be a loss? This is the challenge that insurance carriers are having worldwide, actually. But we're talking about this country right now. And again, we're, we're looking at Florida and we're looking at California because there are active catastrophic events that are transpiring in, as we speak. And it is a challenge. In, in both states, there are issues with insurance availability because of this issue. Different reasons, similar issue. There are less than, I would say, 10%, and that's being generous, of insurance carriers that typically write business in the state of California that are currently offering policies. Now, think about that. That means that around 90% of the insurance companies that write insurance are not offering new policies right now. We, we have a call coming in, so let's take a quick break from that and take our caller. Hello, hello. Thank you for calling in. You are on live with Insurance Hour and me, Carl Sussman. How can I help you? Hi, Carl. Um, love the radio show. Thank you so much for all the wealth of information that you provide. Um, just want to ask a little bit about, I'm having some problems um, just as an agent, um, dealing with agency billing um, for my agency. I mean, really, the process has been just completely complicated. It's a lot of manual things that we have to go through from sending out the invoice, then the client comes into the agency, drops off a check, then from there we have to, you know, put the check into the bank account. We got to wait for the, in- the check to settle. It, it really is a tough process. I see that there's a number of different platforms out there, and and really, I just for my agency, I'm just trying to think what is the best choice that I can make for my agency to be able to provide the best value um, when it comes to handling my agency billing. So, any advice that you'd have on the insurance hour, I'd really appreciate it. 
Sure. Well, I, I appreciate the question. That is definitely in the weeds for us insurance nerds. So let me just let uh, some the average consumer know what we're talking about. There's basically two ways that you get billed for an insurance policy. There's the insurance company sends you the bill, you send them the money, and there's what's called agency bill, where the insurance company sends your insurance agent or broker a bill. The insurance agent or broker sends you the bill, you pay the agent, then the agent turns around and pays the insurance company. And as you've heard, it can be complicated and, and it's a, there are a lot of moving parts. So what's being asked is what type of platform or is there a way to to expedite and to simplify that process? As it turns out, by by dumb luck, I'm an advisor with a company, an insure tech company that is actually handling that entire process. So full disclaimer, I am an advisor on that company. It's called Agent Snap. Uh, if you go to agentsnap.io, A-G-E-N-T-S-N-A-P dot I-O, you'll be able to find information. And they basically take the process and make it what an agency bill process feels like a direct bill process. They handle all of that billing. So the agency basically takes the information and provides it to them. They collect premium. They'll get docs signed. They'll collect premium from the client, send it on directly to the insurance company. So it literally bypasses the agency and having to do all of that extra work. So there are a lot of uh, solutions that are out there, but I find this one to be, of course, I'm biased because, again, I'm involved with them. But I, I think that they are definitely the the leaders in the agency bill uh, work right space right now. Wow, thank you. That's really helpful. I'm, I'm actually on the website um, that you mentioned, and I'm looking at the platform, and, and this actually does everything that I need. And it also seems that it handles premium financing as well. Um, because we wow, you got in there deep, quickly. Yes, that's right. They, they will also uh, allow c consumers, if they can't afford the entire premium, they will enable them to actually um, finance the premium. And again, the insurance carrier gets the full premium, and then the finance company will do the billing again. And that, that is part of the platform. Yeah, this is excellent. Well, thank you so much, Colin. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you for the, the radio show. I'm an avid listener, and you really helped me with that. Well, great. I appreciate it. Thanks so much for the call. You're welcome. Thank you. It's, it's interesting because a lot of times I forget that uh, there's so much that goes on behind the scenes that consumers aren't aware of. And this is actually a major pain point for independent agents and brokers because we don't like to deal with billing. We want to deal with finding the right coverage for our clients and not accounting messes. Listen, let's take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll go back to what we were talking about. We're talking about catastrophic losses and in insurance companies. This is Insurance Hour, and I'm your host, Carl Sussman. We will be back in a flash. Let's talk about earthquakes for a minute. Look, we know we live in earthquake country here in California. Powerful, devastating earthquakes have happened here before, and science says that they will happen again. They can't tell us exactly when. They can just tell us that it is going to happen. Count on it. Prepare for it. Did you know that earthquakes are not covered by your homeowner's insurance policy? You need a separate policy to give you the peace of mind that you will be able to recover without getting financially wiped out the next time we get hit with a big one. There is a great company here in California that will provide you with earthquake coverage you need at a price you can afford. That company is GeoVera. I have a policy through GeoVera. I really like how easy it is to choose from all of their great coverage options, backed by the financial strength that lets me know that they will be here for me when I need them the most. Go to getquake.com forward slash insurance hour to learn more. That's getquake.com slash insurance hour. Make sure you're ready for the day when the ground shakes again. Hello, hello. Welcome back. This is Insurance Hour, and I am your host, Carl Sussman. Thank you so much for being here. Phone lines are open, 559-656-0317. Shoot us a question to questions at insurancehour.com. Join our text group, get updates on insurance-related issues and availability. That's a big one. Just shoot us a text of any kind to 567-4-CARL, 567-367-5275. We'll get you on that list. I promise we don't spam. We literally just send out when something major happens. Okay, before the break, and actually, let me just dovetail on the on the ad that just ran from GeoVera. GeoVera is an earthquake insurance carrier, and they're actually sponsoring today's show. And I have to tell you, uh, I'm pretty picky about sponsors, to be honest, because, again, as an insurance broker and insurance agency and an industry expert, 
I have to be careful whenever I'm making a recommendation. And GeoVera is actually a really, really strong company. I can get my earthquake insurance pretty much wherever I want, as you can imagine. Every carrier wants me to have my business with them because I'm a broker and they figure if I have it, then I'm going to give it to my clients as well. And I have my personal earthquake insurance with GeoVera. So if you don't have earthquake insurance, you really should check it out. They have lots of different options for cost. It's not like it used to be where it's just ridiculously expensive with high deductibles. So again, uh, I would go to getquake.com forward slash insurance hour and check out the prices. Okay, I had to get that off my off my chest because I, I'm a very strong, uh, I have lots of strong feelings about earthquake insurance. I mean, we have earthquakes in California and it always sort of surprises me when people say, do most people get earthquake insurance? And I have to smile and say, well, we have earthquakes. So there you have it. Let's talk a little bit about earthquake insurance. One of the things that it, that most people may not realize is that earthquake damage is not covered under homeowners insurance, condominium owners insurance, or renters insurance. It's actually specifically excluded. Now, prior to 1997, when there was the Northridge earthquake, we used to have a much easier time getting earthquake quotes from pretty much every insurance company. And that's not because the carriers are super generous. It's because the law says if you're offering a property insurance policy like a homeowner's condo or renter, you also do need to offer earthquake insurance. So people would purchase it. It would be what's called an endorsement. It would be an add-on to their actual property insurance policy. And the prices varied. It just depended on what the carrier was. And the coverage was pretty was pretty comprehensive. And, well, without getting into too many specifics, you could get a basic policy for an average-sized house for a couple hundred dollars, maybe, you know, high hundreds if you really wanted to get something fancy with a super low deductible. Then the Northridge earthquake happened, and... Okay, the pun has to be said, shook things up in the market and the insurance industry realized, whoa, with losses that can happen like this, our entire pricing scheme for earthquake insurance is gone. We don't have the ability to offer prices that low when we have the exposure that is now we can see that high. So because of the law in California that required insurance companies to offer earthquake insurance, They said, well, if we have to offer earthquake insurance and we now see we can't afford to do that, we'll then obviously we can't offer the property insurance without breaking the law and not offering earthquake insurance. So they stopped offering the property insurance. So for a period of time, it was a long time, over a year, property insurance carriers were not offering insurance because of that requirement to offer earthquake insurance. This was very, very difficult, as you can imagine. And what finally happened was the creation of the California Earthquake Authority, which is a quasi-state-run insurance company-funded organization that offered basic earthquake insurance. Basic meaning not really coverage for personal property, unless you consider $5,000 a lot. That was what the coverage was. So it was basic coverage, but it satisfied the requirement that the law said for insurance companies to offer earthquake insurance. Once that started to become available, the carriers were able to satisfy the requirement for offering earthquake insurance and the market opened up again. It was very small coverage. Again, it was just enough to satisfy the requirements legally. And to this day, um, it's it's tipped up and back a little bit. They they put their, they dip their toe in the water to try and offer slightly broader coverage. And now they've pushed back again and it's, Basic, basic earthquake coverage for the structure with with relatively average deductibles. Now, some people think, well, is it the least expensive? Is it the most expensive? People have strong opinions, and I always smile to myself because it just depends. You might be in an area, you might have a house built on the construction type or the year built where it's less expensive than getting a policy from another company but you might be in a different area that has the exact opposite experience. You know, side note, there's really never one insurance company that is quote unquote, always the least expensive or always the best. It just doesn't work that way. Homes, properties, cars, you name it. They are underwritten, meaning that they're looked at on a case by case basis. And based on that, the rate comes up. So you're really not going to find a carrier of any kind for any type of insurance that is going to always consistently offer coverage that is less expensive for the most part. Okay. So is the California earthquake authority more expensive or less expensive? The answer is it depends. 
But I'm always a fan of competition and there are companies out there that are offering Quake coverage. So I think it's important that you know that, be aware of that, and know that there are options that are available more probably now than there were prior to the 97 earthquake, if I can say that. I think it's probably true because you do have private companies offering and you do have the California Earthquake Authority that's offering coverage as well. So between all of those options, it's a it's a pretty wide open space. Keep in mind that when there is an earthquake, most earthquake insurance companies will put on what's called a moratorium. They'll say, OK, we're not writing coverage right now because they're waiting for the aftershocks to happen. Not really fair, right, to be able to buy a policy when it's almost literally a certainty within the next 24, 48, maybe a week, you're going to have another shake. So if you're going to get coverage, you need to get it when it's not immediately following an earthquake, because most of the time you won't have the availability of any carrier to offer you an earthquake policy at that point. So, excuse me. So right now, now is a good time because we didn't have a quake in the last week or so. The carriers are open as far as quake goes. So now is a good time to check around and get coverage. Wow. I didn't mean for this to be an entire segment where we're talking about earthquake insurance, but it is that it is that level of importance. Whether it's your home, whether it's your condominium. And remember, if you own a condominium unit, there are two types of coverage. There's coverage that the HOA covers for the building, but there's also a policy that you can get for yourself that's going to cover personal property in your unit. It could potentially cover the loss assessment in the event that there's an assessment to fix the entire building from an earthquake. There are things you want to be aware of. Renters as well. Personal property. Stuff breaks. All right, listen. I need to get off the earthquake track. I have to. So let's take another quick break. When we come back, we will move on to something other than earthquake, I promise. This is Insurance Hour. I'm your host, Carl Sussman. Give us a call, 559-656-0317, and we will talk soon back in a flash. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, in just a few moments, the window to the Magic Podcast Show will begin. My name is Patrick. My name is Calvin. I'm Mouseketeer Gray. My name is Paul, and I will be your guide through the wonderful world of Disney sound experiences. This show is a weekly trip into the world of the Disney theme parks and resorts. And this is the place where you get to use your ears to surround yourself with the magic. For your safety, please remain seated while listening to the Window to the Magic.com podcast. Maybe there's a name for this, something like Disnotic Obsession. Please visit windowtothemagic.com for more information, or you can find us on Apple Podcasts and in the iHeartMedia app. Hello, hello. Welcome back. This is Insurance Hour. I am your host, Carl Sussman. Thank you so much for being here. Phone lines are open, 559-656-0317. Shoot us a question to questions at insurancehour.com. Join the text group conversation at... 567 for Carl. That's 567 367 5275. Now, let's talk a little bit about everybody's favorite topic car insurance. Car insurance. I just have to take a deep breath and say, and, and do what was it on Seinfeld or something where they said, oh, serenity now, serenity now, something like that. Listen, car insurance is one of those things that people absolutely come unglued with. I've been working with consumers for auto insurance for over 30 years. And I can tell you that it's one that gets under people's skin the most. And I want to talk a little bit about why that is and some things that might make you feel a little bit better about it, if that's possible. The number one complaint that I get is I've had my auto insurance. I've been paying for it for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. I've never had a ticket. I've never had an accident. Now, all of a sudden, I have an accident and my rate's going up. That's not fair. So let me pull back the curtain a little bit and explain why that happens. It might not make you feel better, but at least you'll understand why. Now, an insurance policy has a period of time, right? It's, for example, six months. Most auto insurance policies, they go for six months. And during that six-month period of time, the insurance carrier is basically on the hook for whatever might happen that's covered under their auto insurance policy. It might be an accident. It might be a little one. It might be a big one. It might be... Who knows what it might be, but they're on the hook for that. 
Now, at the end of that six month period, the insurance company is going to say, okay, let's look at what's happened in the last six months. Do we want to keep this person insured? Do we not want to keep this person insured? What are, what are our models? What does all of the actuarial studies do tell us based on what this person's history was in the last six months? If you have not had a ticket or accident, the likelihood is the insurance carrier will say, okay, this was good. No tickets. Tickets, by the way, are indicators of potential future accidents, in case you're wondering. Tickets, accidents, hmm, it's been good. We're willing to insure this person, and here's what we're willing to pay them. Then the consumer gets that bill and that renewal notice, and they say, okay, do I want to stay married to this insurance company for another six months? They look at the price, they look at the policy provisions, and they decide whether they want to keep that policy. And for this discussion, let's just say they agree, yep. I'm willing to pay that money. I'm going to keep this policy in force. And let's say that goes on again for 10 years and nothing changes. Now we're on year 11. Now you have an accident. Something happens. Let's not worry about fault, not at fault. Let's just say you had an accident. Now the insurance company is involved and the insurance company has to pay their claims adjuster. They have to pay their body shop. Let's even say it's not your fault. They have to pay their claims adjuster to subrogate, which means they're going to pay for your damage. Then they're going to go to the other insurance company and say, hey, your person was at fault. Reimburse us for what we had to pay our client. They're going to do all these things. These things cost money. So they're doing all of this. And now let's say your policy is coming up for renewal. How do you think you look to that insurance company versus how you looked for the last 10 years? Different for sure, right? I mean, you have had an accident. So okay, that's happened. They have had to spend money to deal with the claim, whether it's paying the body shop, paying for you to have a rental car, whatever it might be. You're a different risk profile. You're a different person at that point. So they're going to look at that information and they're going to make a determination whether they want to continue insuring you again. Remember, insurance policies, again, in this example, go for six months. And they do that because they can't go forever, right? Nobody would want to be locked in. Can you imagine calling an insurance agent or broker and you're getting an auto insurance policy and you are contractually obligated to keep it forever? I don't think you'd be really happy about that. And the insurance carriers wouldn't be either. So we are, we're happy that we have these renewal periods because it gives us the ability to decide do we want to renew our vows with this carrier or not and vice versa. So the insurance carrier is going to look at, okay, so they had this accident. Now, are they also going to say, this is the first accident that there's been in the last 10 years? Absolutely. Are they going to look and say, was this their fault or not? Absolutely. If it wasn't an accident, if it was just a speeding ticket, are they going to look at that differently? Of course. And they're going to come up with a rate that's based on, again, what the math shows. Someone that is your age, has all of the characteristics that you have, and just had a speeding ticket or just had an accident, how does that change the likelihood of a further claim from occurring? That's what they're going to do. And they're going to give you a number based on that. Is that number going to be higher than if than it was the last 10 years when nothing was happening? Yeah, it will. And it's not because they're trying to be mean. It's not because they're trying to gouge you. It's not because they're trying to do anything other than look at the last six months, look at the most recent data and make a decision about what the math shows is going to potentially happen in the future. Can you imagine if we only rated people based on what they were in the past 10 years? Would you like to say you're the same person you were 10 years ago? I know I'm not. I know I'm quite a different person than I was 10 years ago, for better or for worse. I think that a more accurate picture of who I am today is how I've been in the last six months or the last year, let's say, versus how was I 10 years ago? That's what the insurance carriers are doing. So when the policy is renewing, they're looking at the most recent version of you, if I can say it that way. So I get it. It's frustrating because our pocketbook says, wait a minute, I've been paying with this and paying and paying and paying, and there hasn't been a claim for all this time. Why is it that all of a sudden now I'm in this situation where my rate's going up because I just had a ticket or I just had an accident? Hopefully this sheds a little bit of light on it for you. Keep in mind as well, that carriers are forced, depending on the state that they're in, to follow certain guidelines. For example, in California, there are laws that dictate how far back an insurance company can look to decide on your particular rate. There are guidelines that say how much they're allowed to surcharge for an accident, for example. There are laws that say how long they're allowed to do that. 
right? So for example, in California, if you have one person that has never had a speeding ticket and another person that has had 10 speeding tickets, obviously we would say that second person is probably not as good a driver, probably more likely to have an accident. In three years, both of those people get a good driver discount, both the one with it that had never had a ticket and the one that's had 10 tickets. So the count, the, the, the regulators and the laws that are on the books have a lot to do also with how auto insurance rates are determined. It's not just up to the carriers to make these decisions on their own. The competitive marketplace does help, but everyone has to color in the lines. Everybody has to stay within the guidelines that exist. They can't just make whatever rules they want up and, and go forward from there. So hopefully that gives you an idea of why your auto insurance rate might fluctuate after you have some type of a claim or some type of an accident or a ticket or who knows what it might be. Let's take another quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk about some more fun stuff. Remember, phone lines are open, 559-656-0317. This is Insurance Hour, and I am your host, Carl Sussman. We will be back in a flash. Do you need homeowner's insurance? Has your previous insurance company left the state, non-renewed your policy, or maybe they just raised your premium to an amount that you simply can't afford? Whatever the situation, we can help. Just dial pound 250 on your cell phone and say keyword insurance quote, and we will connect you with an agent who can assist you right away. Or if you prefer, you can visit us online at insurancehour.com forward slash quotes. Whether you're looking for homeowner's insurance or auto insurance, we'll send the best option straight to you. So what are you waiting for? Simply dial pound 250 and say keyword insurance quote, and we will connect you with a live agent to help provide competitive quotes for your homeowner's insurance or auto insurance. Don't get caught unprepared. Insure what matters with an insurance company you can trust and with a premium that you can afford. Don't put off until tomorrow what you should have done yesterday. Simply dial pound 250 on your cell phone and say keyword insurance quote. Hello, hello. Welcome back. This is Insurance Hour. I am your host, Carl Sussman. Thank you so much for being here. Phone lines are open, 559-656-0317. You can call or text that number. Send us your questions to questions at insurancehour.com. Also, you can join the text group. It's just text anything, text something nice. Don't be obnoxious. To 5674-CARL, that's 567-367-5275. Now, this has been a jam-packed show with a lot of information. So if you're just tuning in or you're catching this somewhere midway, jump online and go get a copy of this show so that you can have the entire show and get all the information. Just search for Insurance Hour. You'll find us on Apple Podcasts, iHeartMedia, TuneIn, um, Amazon, Alexa. Sorry, I said it. I activated your Amazon device. We're also on YouTube if you're curious what I look like. And I've been told I have a face for radio. So let's stick with that, right? Back to everything. So we're talking about all sorts of things today, and I want to move on to life insurance. Now, life insurance is one of those things where I, some people are so uncomfortable talking about life insurance. It's just unbelievable to me. And what's interesting is it's really cultural because uh, in, in our country, in the United States, death is viewed very differently than it is in other parts of the world. I'll give you an, an interesting example. The average person in this country, okay, never sees or maybe sees once or twice in their lifetime a a dead body. That is not the way it is in most parts of the world. It's different. Our relationship with death is just different overall. So obviously when we're talking about life insurance, we're talking about death. So our relationship with that concept, with having an insurance policy that pays out when somebody dies is obviously very different as well. I've spoken to people from other countries And they don't have that stigma. When I mention life insurance or they bring it up to me or we're just talking about how are things where you are and and how does the system work, they they just view it differently. They're saying, well, well, the life insurance, of course you have to have that because everybody dies. (laughs) Yes, this is true. But for some reason, again, it's just a different feel for people in this country. Now, life insurance, why do you have it? Why do you need to have it? The first thing that comes to mind is, well, I have a large mortgage on my house. And if if I die or when I die, I want to be sure that my beneficiaries don't have to have this huge mortgage to pay. Or in the case of what's happening these days, my adjustable mortgage that's going up, 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 up. 
I want to be sure that there's a lump of money for them to at least buy that mortgage down or take that money, invest it somewhere and have money to be able to pay for that mortgage, right? So mortgage protection insurance was really the first part of life insurance that started gaining some popularity in the United States. Fun fact, mortgage protection insurance had a level premium, right? Meaning that you always pay the same amount. However, the death benefit would go down, right? Because it would follow your mortgage, which not a lot, but goes down every single year. So what was happening was people were paying more for less the longer they lived. So that's not a very popular type of life insurance anymore. What most people will do is simply purchase term life insurance. They'll buy a policy for 30 years, let's say, and they pay the same amount for the 30 years and the payout amount, the death benefit is the same also for 30 years. Now, the mortgage is going down, so that difference is up to the beneficiary what they're going to do with it. As a matter of fact, with term insurance, the payout is not made to the lender. It's made directly to the beneficiary, meaning if the if the beneficiary says, you know what, I don't want to use this money to pay down this mortgage. I'd rather just keep this mortgage. You know, whoever got this mortgage locked it in back when interest rates were 2 and 3%. I don't want to pay that off. I can make more than that putting this money you know, in the bank or in the stock market. They can do that. So most people, if they're going to look to protect their actual mortgage, they're going to purchase a term life insurance policy versus a, an actual mortgage protection policy for that reason. And that makes sense. You will still find them. But be careful of terminology, because a lot of times people are going to they're going to say it's mortgage protection insurance, but it's term insurance. But the actual what it used to be ter, um, mortgage protection insurance is not typically the best option in general, because, again, you're paying a level amount for a decreasing benefit. Not so good. Right now, term insurance is one type of life insurance. But as you can imagine, some people realize that. Well, I might not die in the next 30 years. Of course, it could happen, but I want to know that when I die, whether that's within 30 years or it's or sometime after that, there's going to be insurance in place to pay out to my beneficiary. Now, that type of insurance is not term insurance, which is not for a specific term or period of time. It's going to be for your entire life. There are many different variations of life insurance that go on beyond just a specific term. There's whole life insurance. There's universal life insurance. There's index life insurance. I mean, I, I could go on and we could do an entire show or two or three that does nothing other than talk about the different types of life insurance products that exist. But for you to get a general idea, let's just separate them between temporary life insurance, which is called term insurance and permanent life insurance, which could be all of these other types of insurance products. Like I said, whole life, variable, variable life, universal life, you name it, it's there. Now, permanent life insurance policies, because they come in so many flavors, you need to understand what the difference is between them. The best thing to do is find a really good agent or broker that knows this stuff. This is not usually the guy you're getting your car insurance from or gal. I hate to say it, but it's usually true. Unless you're working with a brokerage that has different people that specialize in different things, you might want to find someone that specializes in life insurance and work with them and not just assume, well, insurance is insurance. I'll get my insurance, my life insurance from the same guy that writes my health insurance or my car insurance or my home insurance. It's kind of like, uh, yeah, you, you can go to the market and get whatever you want. But if you really want to get something special, you probably have to go to a specialty store, right? You want to get that really fresh French bread. You're not going to get it at the average chain store market. You're going to have to go to the locally owned uh, Italian restaurant, let's say. Mmm, fresh bread. I love it. Nothing is better than good bread out of the oven, some butter on it. Mm, mm, mm. Now, now I'm hungry for bread. So again, understand when we're talking about life insurance, this is something that I feel very strongly about. We all die. No question. It, it happens. You can't avoid that. So it's a very inexpensive way, relatively speaking, to leave something for people behind that you're leaving behind that will make it a little bit easier when you're gone. It's a terrible thing, but it's true. When I've had to deliver a check for someone who to a beneficiary when they're in, when the insured person has died, the person is devastated, right? They're, they've had a horrible loss. They've lost somebody. And I show up and I have money. Maybe it makes you feel a little bit icky, but you know what? Money makes people happy. Sorry. Even in those sad times when they've lost someone, to have somebody show up with a nice check 
tends to make people feel a little bit better. Money can't buy love, and it certainly can't re- replace the person they've lost. But it's certainly better than having somebody show up with another bill or an invoice, right? Let's take another quick break. We will be done with life insurance. We'll move on to something else. This is Insurance Hour, and I'm Carl Sussman. We will be back in a flash. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, in just a few moments, the window to the Magic Podcast Show will begin. My name is Patrick. My name is Calvin. I'm Mouseketeer Gray. My name is Paul, and I will be your guide through the wonderful world of Disney sound experiences. This show is a weekly trip into the world of the Disney theme parks and resorts. And this is the place where you get to use your ears to surround yourself with the magic. For your safety, please remain seated while listening to the Window to the Magic.com podcast. Maybe there's a name for this. Something like Disnotic Obsession. Please visit windowtothemagic.com for more information, or you can find us on Apple Podcasts and in the iHeartMedia app. Hello, hello. Welcome back. This is Insurance Hour, and I am your host, Carl Sussman. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Phone lines are open, 559-656-0317. Call or text that number. Shoot your questions over via email to questions at insurancehour.com. If you want to get some text updates on insurance matters, give us a text to 5674-CARL. That's 567-F-O-R-K-A-R-L. Or again, three, uh, 567-367-5275. It's been a great show so far. If you've missed any of it, jump online. Just go to insurancehour.com. You'll find copies of all the shows there. Or you can go to your favorite podcast aggregator or go to YouTube. Go wherever. Search for Insurance Hour. You'll, you'll find us there. No problem. All right, we've talked about auto insurance. We've talked about life insurance. I want to talk about renter's insurance because we hear a lot about the struggles for homeowners, right? And at the same time, there's news about how hard it is to buy a home, right? And how unaffordable it is to get homes. And so we have a lot of people that are renting. And so I think people and renter's insurance sort of flies under the radar. So let's spend a little bit of time talking about why it's important to have renter's insurance. Now, what is renter's insurance? Okay. You are renting, let's just say you are renting an apartment. Now, you're in that apartment. So what's covered under your renter's insurance policy? Well, let's start with the obvious stuff. Your stuff, your personal property. When you beg all of your friends to box up your stuff and move it from one place to another, give them big hugs. Those are the real friends, the ones that show up to actually help you move your stuff. That's your stuff. Those, that's the main thing you're going to be purchasing renter's insurance for is protection for your stuff. So it's not things that are in the apartment. If you're getting a furnished apartment, you're not going to be insuring that. You are just insuring your stuff. What are you insuring it for? Typically, you're going to be insuring it for things like fire, theft, and damage by water. And let me tell you something. We see damage by water in for people that are renting probably more frequently than anything else. It's that neighbor upstairs that left their sink running or it's their bathtub that overflowed because they fell asleep in the tub. Yes, I've heard it happen. Or there's a pipe that broke in the wall and it damaged your expensive TV that you mounted, right? All these things happen. And if you're a renter, a lot of times your first thought is, oh, I'll just get them to pay for it. Well, let's remember, not everyone has the ability to just pay you for damage they've caused to your stuff. Have a renter's policy, let the insurance company pay for it. And if they can go back to that neighbor upstairs and get reimbursed for it, great, more power for them. But you can get the coverage. So the first thing that renter's insurance policies cover is your personal property, your stuff. The next thing a renter's insurance policy is going to cover is liability coverage. And that's a really big one. What is liability coverage? Okay, this is you're at the airport and you're walking along. You're, of course, stressed out and everything's a mess because airports and you put your bag down to check your phone to see if there's been a change in the gate or who knows what's going on you put the bag down somebody walks and they're tripping over your bag and they fall down yes it happens and they're going to sue you because maybe they they sprained their pinky maybe they were on their way to an important conference and now they can't go and all this stuff happens well now, assuming that you're found negligent for doing that and for leaving your, your suitcase in the middle of the walkway and somebody falls, whatever the case may be, 
they're, they're going to try and get money from you. And you're going to be in a position where you have to either pay money to them for those losses, or you're going to have to fight them in court, which costs money, right? What's, what's better to write a check yourself or to have an insurance company get their, their heavy hitters, right? That are used to doing this for a living to protect you and to represent you. Well, obviously the answer is it's better to have the professionals do it and have them being paid by the insurance company than for you to have to go find an attorney and get someone that's going to defend you in this situation. So liability insurance is a major benefit of renter's insurance. And people don't think about that. They're thinking, well, I don't own a home. Why do I need insurance? (laughs) You still have an exposure. You still have a liability exposure. When you're walking around, you have liability exposure. And let's face it, in this country, people will sue you for anything. You look at them sideways, they're going to sue you. It, I can't say I've seen that one specifically happen, but I'm sure it has. I'm sure someone has sued someone else for looking at them sideways because that other person took it as a threat or the who the heck knows. So the point is, and you know this is true, this is a lot of, a lot of lawsuits happen in this country like it happens and like it does not happen in other places in the world. So having liability insurance, having an insurance carrier behind you to be able to pick up those expenses and pay for them. And if it turns out that you are negligent, even pay for those expenses that the person that you, you hurt or injured has, has uh, incurred, that's huge. Now, just to give you an example, and again, you know, your, your mileage may vary. Renter's insurance is super, super inexpensive. You're talking about, let's just call it $500 a year. And what are you getting for $500 a year? And again, I'm, I'm, I'm being very generic, but I'm not too far off typically. We could be talking about twenty or thirty thousand dollars in personal property, right? That's all of your stuff. That's if all of a sudden you left, uh, you you went home today, and everything you had is gone. You would have a check that you could start writing checks to buy things for up to let's just say thirty thousand dollars. Not too bad for the five hundred dollars a year that you were paying, right? But on top of it, that liability exposure that you have, that liability policy might be up to half a million dollars. Half a million dollars. That's a lot of cheese, man. That's a lot of money that the insurance company is on the hook for to pay the attorneys, to pay to get this other party that's coming after you for something to go away. $500 for half a million dollars? That's a lot of extra zeros. Again, I'm generalizing, but I'm not too far off. I'm telling you, I've been doing this for a long time. Now, if you're in an area that is high brush, right? And then there aren't as many companies writing, things like that happen, sure. You might be looking at more than $500, but generally speaking, you are not going to find renter's insurance policies that cost thousands and thousands of dollars. Unless again, you have $100,000 in personal property and you have fine art you wanna have coverage for and you have expensive jewelry that you wanna insure. There's always ways to do to get higher premiums. But the average person that's going to buy a renter's insurance policy in the average city, and they're going to have, you know, 10, 15, 20,000, 30,000 in personal property, half a million dollars in liability, it's not going to be expensive. It's not going to be something that you can't afford. What do they always say? It's your Starbucks drink for the first six months of the year. If you just cut back on that, you've paid for it, which I'm not saying you should because I wouldn't be able to cut back on my Starbucks intake. Now, renters insurance policies do cover other things in addition to personal property. And in addition to liability, they'll pay for things like additional living expense. So if you have to move out, maybe there's a loss to the building and you can't live there anymore. You have to quickly find somewhere to go. Renters policies most of the time will cover that expense as well. So check into renters insurance if you don't have it and you are a renter. Not expensive, a lot of benefits for it, all right? Now, we have one more segment to go. Let's take our final break. When we come back, we're going to talk about, oh, can't tell you. You'll have to wait. That was just a great teaser. This is Insurance Hour. I'm Carl Sussman. Thank you so much for being here. Stand by. We will be back in a flash. Are you feeling lost in the search for the right insurance? Making call after call, only to find no one willing to go that extra mile for you? At Sussman Insurance Agency, we understand that frustration, and we're here to change your experience. Where others see obstacles, we see opportunities. While many might shy away from jumping through hoops, at Sussman Insurance Agency, we are prepared to leap. Looking under every rock, exploring every avenue, that's not just what we do, it's who we are. 
Our dedicated team doesn't just offer policies, we provide solutions. Solutions born from persistence, expertise, and a genuine commitment to finding you the best coverage possible. We don't just meet expectations, we surpass them. If you're tired of hearing no or it's not possible, it's time to turn to a team that believes in yes and let's make it happen. Don't settle for less. Reach out to Sussman Insurance Agency at 877-411-5200. Visit us online at sussmaninsurance.com or email sales at sussmaninsurance.com. Let's uncover the insurance solutions you deserve. Sussman Insurance Agency, going the extra mile every time. Hello, hello. This is Insurance Hour, and I am your host, Carl Sussman. Thank you so much for being here. Phone lines are still open, 559-656-0317. Call or text or shoot your question over via email to questions at insurancehour.com. Love getting those. We do entire shows just on questions that are sent in. Those are always super fun. If you do call the number and you get the voicemail, you want to be on the show, just say, hey, here's my question. Go ahead, play my question on the air. Or if you prefer to keep it private, I'll just read your question and I'll give the answer. There's been a ton of information on this show. If you've missed any, jump online, search for Insurance Hour, find out where you can grab this episode and listen to it. Watch it. It's got some really good stuff. Now, one final thing I want to say before I continue. I do my very best to give you the most up-to-date and accurate information, but I'm only human. Sometimes I might get it wrong. If you hear something that does not sound right to you, if you hear something that you say, you know what, I just was told something that's different than that, or I've read something that's different than that, please reach out to me and let me know, because what I want to do is I want to find out for you and for me what the correct information is. This isn't about ego. This is about getting the correct information out to everybody. So if you hear something and it doesn't seem right, let me know. Shoot me an email. Give a call, leave a number with the, leave a voice message or talk to someone when they answer the phone. We do have people answering the phone around the clock for the most part and say, hey, I heard Carl say this. I think it's that. What do you think? And I will go find out. It's important that I give you the best information I can. And if I don't, and if I tell you that everything I say is just 100% accurate always, no matter what, I'd be lying because nobody always has it correct and nobody can know everything, right? Right. I might know more than you, but I don't know everything about insurance. And insurance is very fluid. It changes like the weather. It's a horrible expression these days. All right, enough said. Let's get on to our last topic. We've talked about different types of insurance. I want to talk about what can you do to try and prevent having claims? Because let's face it, that's what you want to do. The best claim is no claim. Not having a loss means no loss. (laughs) Nothing bad has happened. You haven't lost anything, right? Sometimes people forget that the best thing is not to find a way to get coverage, is to not have the claim to begin with. You're going to have a lower premium if you're not paying claims. You're not going to have the heartache of dealing with claims. You're not going to have the premium increase later if potentially you're found to be at fault for a certain type of claim. So what can we do to keep our premiums lower? What can we do to prevent losses from happening? Now, as far as property risks go. There's something called home hardening, which is to do things to your home to make it less likely to suffer in a natural disaster. This can vary depending on where you are. If you're in an area that is fire ridden, right? Or you're in the brush, you're in the hills, you're in the canyons, things like that. Or even if you're not, you want to make your house less likely to burn. You can do things like change the roof type to make it less likely to burn. There are certain specific types of roofs. You can clear the brush around your house. I know you've heard it before, but it's true. There is a lot of brush around homes, a lot of trees, a lot of shrubs, things that, let's face it, they're not gorgeous. They're just kind of there. I know it's not always cheap to get rid of some of that stuff, but it will pay dividends for your insurance at the end of the day. So see what you can do for that. Now, they call it defensible space. The more space you have around your house, that a fire crew can get to, to utilize, to try and prevent the fire from getting to you is helpful. The less likely it is for your house to catch on fire, okay? There are entire programs online that you can check out that will give you information on home hardening. If you're in California as well, you can check out Safer from Wildfires. That is a something on the California Department of Insurance website if you wanna get more information. There are lots and lots of tools out there to help you get ideas on things you can do to help make your house less likely to burn. Now, for flood damage, and we're seeing this all over the place now, you can do things like keep the expensive items off the floor, okay? I know it sounds ridiculous, but it's true. There are some things you can do that you can keep some of the expensive items higher up. Maybe put it on the second floor. Maybe have it mounted to the wall, things like that. Utilities, 
uh, use flood barriers and water resistant material. And a lot of this just comes down to common sense. If you're going to have a lot of damage coming from water, you want to have the best tools to try and move the water away. That might be something as simple as keeping the debris out of your drains. It might be something more complicated, like closing off those lower uh, crawl space for um, e um, little you know, the chicken wesh that's down there to keep water from as easily being able to get under your house. That's a big one because once water gets in, it's there and it's going to start collecting. It's going to start rising. And that's rain damage as well. We're not just talking about floods, but if you ha- if there's storms that are coming and we've had some crazy storms across the country, you'd be better off to prevent having a water damage claim than to have one. And then again, you'll be in that situation like we talked about in the first segment of this show where all of a sudden you're not a great client that's never had a claim ever and ever and ever. You're a client that has had a loss and the insurance company has had to pay out money. And yes, you are going to pay more money from there. So it's a double whammy. First, you're going to have the loss, which is bad. Then you're going to turn out having to pay higher premiums. So doing things preemptively to try and prevent losses from happening really is the best thing to do. It's the best way to go. Now, other things you can do is to engage with your community. Now, I know, who's your neighbor? You have any idea? Any idea? I can actually tell you, and I'm proud to say, after 25 some odd years, what am I saying in the house? I do know who our neighbors are because they've changed, but I know who they are. Not A lot of people don't. Find out who your neighbors are. Talk about Neighborhood Watch. Create some kind of a communication network. Maybe start a group, a text group, or a WhatsApp group, or a Facebook group, or whatever, whatever group. Be able to reach out to your neighbors because it can make a difference to prevent crime. It can make a difference that you have some type of connectivity to each other. I know when there's large fires that are happening or there's crime sprees that are happening, there is something to be said for being able to be in touch with people that you literally could be rubbing elbows with at your house, right? I know the old saying, people just, you know, they don't want to be around their neighbors, they're bad neighbors, they play music, their kids are loud, who knows what it is, they fly drones, okay. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't have some means of communication, keeping an open communication channel and, again, helping each other prepare for potential disasters. And if something happens, knowing that there's a central place that people can get back together and speak and be able to connect with each other to try and help each other out. You'd be surprised. Even that neighbor that you might not like, you might be very thankful when all of a sudden you realize that in the event of some type of a disaster, you can reach out to them or they can reach out to you. I know it might not feel like it, but it is absolutely true. And also, and I'll leave you with this, this one part for preparedness is come up with some type of a disaster plan. It doesn't have to be major. You don't have to write the whole thing down and draw it with diagrams, but have an idea. Have a go bag, maybe. At least know in the event you're going to have to leave, make sure that you know what it is you want to take with you, what it is that's important to you to keep. Do you have to take everything with you? Everything with you? If not, Don't try to have a list so you know what it is you're going to take in an event of an emergency, what you're going to grab and what you're going to run with. Okay, there are lots of resources online for you to go to to find out things about disaster preparedness. I invite you to do so. I appreciate everyone being here today. If you've missed any part of the show, please go back, look up the show, listen to the beginning of it. I will talk with you again soon. You have been learning from Insurance Hour and I'm your host, Carl Sussman. Thank you so much. I do want to thank all of you for taking the time to listen today. I know insurance is not necessarily the most sexy concept. It's not the most exciting thing in the world. It is important that you understand what it is you're getting, what you should be looking for, red flags, you name it. You just need to know more than you used to. Things are more complicated than they used to be. If you have any questions, please reach out to me directly. You can email your questions to questions at insurancehour.com or call and leave a voicemail at 559 656-0317. Educating and entertaining Californians one insurance policy at a time. This is Insurance Hour. The show is dedicated to Shamrock Papa.